This is all about getting uh, some new expertise. So, so that's how it is. Economics is a different thing. Okay, so um, where were we? So here it is uh, the bi-deforming, and uh, we said that bi-deforming has an advantage that in situ, uh, you know, you can, you can, um, you can uh, get rid of the carbon that's deposited. Then you have um, oxidative bi-deforming. So there is the difference is, okay, uh, the normal bi-deforming, we know what it is. Uh, we also know what is methanol synthesis. And then uh, we also have at the top methane combustion, partial uh, or combustion of some methane. So if you can balance them out, then you can have what you got from this uh, combination of reactions where everything is reacted, methane, some oxygen, some hydrogen, uh, water vapor, some CO2 giving you directly to uh, give directly um, methanol. So these are another. These are all another possibilities. Uh, this is another possibility. Sorry. Um, then, uh, so this. Uh, so in the previous three slides, what we did was uh, we looked at uh, different ways of deforming uh, the methane uh, with the help of uh, steam, with the help of CO2, with the help of oxygen and, uh, and uh, uh, as a combination of using all of these three reactants. So, there are, so these are the possibilities uh, that are summarized in this particular slide and it's um, nothing other than that and this, um, this is ex exactly a summary of what we have done before but in general this also is a, um, this also is a step wherein from methane, if you want, you can get very high grade carbon. Uh, getting an ash free high grade carbon is also an important, um, important uh, objective. Okay. Then the other bit that I wanted to show you is that the um, CO2 based um, CO2 and syngas reforming. So in syngas, we, um, we have said that um, you need only carbon monoxide and hydrogen, but also if you have carbon dioxide in the mix, then as a combination of these three reactions happening simultaneously in parallel, uh, you can get, so uh, where you have methane, where you have steam, and where you have also CO2, these are all, technically these are all products of gasification. Then under the right conditions, you can directly go into the methanol. The reason we have been focusing on methanol and methanol and methanol is simply because as we showed in the pre one of the first few slides, that methanol is really uh, a, um, a, um, a building block, block for uh, many other, many other uh, compounds. Uh, methanol economy has been touted. Uh, if methanol is a very good energy carrier, can be uh, compared to hydrogen, it can be carried from one place to long distances uh, rather easily. So uh, in as much as hydrogen economy was once touted as the savior, now methanol economy is, is um, also gaining momentum. So, uh, methanol, what's the boiling temperature of methanol? But this one is liquid in normal uh, in the Let's go to the other. No, that's fine. So that's the one of the advantages of open transportation point of view. So now, uh, focusing the, uh, shifting the focus slightly away from natural gas or steam gas uh, to uh, biomass. So you technically can also have uh, biomass to methanol and there are different ways that we have seen before, particularly the left hand side one 
that we have discussed, the biomass to gasification to syngas to gas cleanup, and then if hydrogen can also come in from some other sources, let's put, uh, let's talk where this, so then where it can come from a bit later, then you can go into methanol from the left, left side. And if you have waste products, but not gasification, but the anaerobic digestion route, the, which is fermentation, then also through gas cleaning, which is different degrees of gas cleaning, different uh, less complexities of gas cleaning, you can um, come into the same methanol route. Uh, so this, um, this essentially, this is what um, what uh, the uh, route to produce the methanol from the solid reactors solid uh, solid um, compounds a uh, solid uh, feedstock i mean which um, which is uh, which is biomass in this instance okay let me just put this in so so let's um, now shift our focus again back to dimethyl ether and then we in the and then we'll have a larger one on dimethyl carbonate a bit later on so this is the conventional route of making uh, making uh, dimethyl ether, uh, con uh, but um, so, that, so that you have the methanol, and then if you have a dehydration catalyst, you dehydrate it, and then you get um, the dimethyl ether, which is the first molecule on the right hand side, and water vapor simply goes out. That's the conventional one, but of course. Um, you are looking at two different reactors if you want to get it uh, made at the same site. If you are buying the, buying the methanol from an external source, um, then obviously you will be looking only a single uh, dehydration catalyst. But uh, there, there are companies uh, who have patented, particularly the Japanese, um, who have looked at uh, directly to produce. Uh, and it's commercially they can offer uh, either for one is to two or uh, one is to one, whatever hydrogen, uh, carbon monoxide and hydrogen ratios are available, you can make the dimethyl ether. And uh, in one case, if you have more hydrogen, as you would expect, the hydrogen has to, uh, has to go towards uh, something, stable molecule is water vapor. And if you have less hydrogen, then um, all the hydrogen is, um, is um, subsumed into the dimethyl ether and what is left is carbon dioxide. So it depends on, the, depends on what is available to the client in terms of the gas composition, uh, whether it is 1 is to 2 or 1 is to 1. Um, that's how it is. Either way, the, uh, the uh, energy requirements and yeah, so the temperatures and the pressures are very, very similar. Uh, for both of these cases, you'll be looking at 30, 40 bar, and about 400 degrees Celsius. So these are commercially available. Oh yes, catalyst. These are all catalytic reactions that we, I have been talking in this particular, um, particular module, that without heterogeneous catalysis, you cannot progress to this uh, products at all. Just the variation of the gas feed composition that that um, gives you uh, the uh, uh, the other undesired product that I mentioned. Here, uh, your desired product is uh, dimethyl ether, but the undesired product is water vapor or uh, CO2, whatever be the case, catalysts are the same. So same in uh, dry reforming, as I said, the um, same similar temperature range, 800 to 1000 degrees, uh, the, if you might, might have noticed that the catalysts are the same. So as long as your products is the same, your reactor type is, should remain the same, and your uh, catalyst will also be very similar. Huh? Fixed bed reactors. Fixed bed reactors. Uh, the catalyst 
Yeah. So, Kathleen, we mentioned that the one of the problems with uh, with uh, anything to do with carbon-containing gases is that um, is that the carbon deposition is often a problem, is is the major problem, but not everything is lost. If carbon deposition is there, then you can steam that side. So, with the help of the steam or with the help of CO2, steam is faster. Uh, you can get rid of it and then the catalyst become regenerated uh, and you can use it. Everything that we have been discussing in this is catalytic. Which, which is followed. Usually this, uh, these are the ones which are given performance guarantee by the technology developers, that's the one that you will take. So at the end of the day, if you are the client, if uh, sorry, yeah, if you are the client, um, if you are paying all the money to build a plant, then you would like to get the product trouble free, continuously, and without any, you know, disruption. So correct. So uh, it has to be uh, fully guaranteed performance, and therefore, th that's why I had these two headlines. So thermicity is a good problem to have. You can extract so much heat, generate steam or hot water, whatever is the case, cogeneration purpose, a, 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 a lot of possibilities. Not a problem. Excellent. So, so, so whatever be the case, endothermicity or exothermicity is a fact of catalytic reactions, life. Minus is usually positive, uh, exothermic, plus is that's the convention, I don't know why we did it, uh, mechanical engineering, so it's, the chemists are different. It is, which is so much easier. Rather than, rather than trying to reach from Delhi to Hardwar in one go, you break the journey somewhere, so much easier, refresh, <laughs> then go back. <laughs> it's just like that. L literally, it's like that. Slow and steady wins the race. I think the next generation of entrepreneurs such as you guys will go directly to that. <laughs> <laughs> and we, we all these conservative ones. Yeah. Eh? Mm. Oh, dimethyl ether is a fantastic gas turbine fuel. And it's completely non toxic, doesn't produce NOx, doesn't produce soot also. Okay, so you all know it. Yeah. Here, environmentally benign, non-toxic, non-corrosive gas, potential diesel substitute, refrigerant, aerosol propellant. Most of these petroleum derived products, I mean, they originally derived from petroleum. They can be, they are used, yeah. That needs to be checked, yes, that's uh, that I don't know. But uh, they're very well known. Maybe there are maybe other applications which I do not know of. Hmm? Why? You 
find it out and let me know. That's your homework tomorrow morning. I know you come every day, so that's good. So you, you tell me tomorrow. Huh? But the, his question is why? There you go. So th this is one of the problems with oil that you can get from many other sources. Like, uh, you know, people have been talking about, buoyant about algae. Algae capturing CO2 and growing. But it has got so much nitrogen during the, its growth process. This one doesn't have any. No, uh, compare it with any fuel that you can burn. You can burn liquid fuels too. Mm. They they have some nitrogen. The uh, natural gas can have some nitrogen. You cannot completely eliminate it the way it is prepared. So, so, so find it out. Find the last of the advantages that you are still not happy with, and then tomorrow morning you will tell us. Okay. Okay. So, so so far we have been talking about the heterogeneous catalysis-based um, um, synthesis only. This is another. Then another route that had been proposed, but it's only proposed, not practiced necessarily, that you have the, the thermal gasification that we talk about, um, which produces, um, you know, uh, after tar removal and, uh, and gas cleanup, etc., um, etc., in here, which you can go into the DME path. But also, um, it, you can go from the central biomass plant if you can take it to the um, solid oxide uh, electrolyzers uh, or the fuel cell. Then technically from the fuel cell, you can go water-assisted to or water-assisted electrolysis. You can actually get hydrogen. And then that hydrogen can be brought that hydrogen can be brought back into the methanol synthesis. So one of the questions that often arises is for the uh, methanol synthesis and other um, applications is that where will the hydrogen come from? Because uh, we say that coal or biomass has only how much percentage hydrogen? Four to five percent. So not much really. And then all the hydrogen economy and making hydrogen from gasification. We found out that hydrogen is actually made from the breakage of the steam molecule or water molecule by using the energy embedded in carbon. That's why. So here, so there the hydrogen, predominantly hydrogen comes from there that way. Here the hydrogen can come from the uh, electrolysis of the water. And uh, the, it's uh, rapidly growing rapidly growing, uh, this um, uh, the water assisted electrolysis. I mean, uh, proof of concept is there. You can actually um, uh, buy hydrogen uh, uh, electroly uh, the water electrolyzer uh, producing hydrogen small units. Forget about the cost issue. And uh, if it becomes a driver, then obviously it will become um, efficient over a period of time. So the concept here is that in addition to, in addition to um, supplying, supplying uh, hydrogen and CO, etc., uh, you can actually do from the gasification only. You can actually get the hydrogen from the um, uh, electrolysis. So, if you are doing, for example, CO2 gasification as you would be doing, then you'll be getting lots of CO. So, hydrogen has to come from there. There will be ideal opportunity to club this, um, either um, from the water-assisted electrolysis. And then you get your 
whatever ratios of if the carbon monoxide and the hydrogen can come from two different independent sources then that gives you the uh, control knob to um, to tweak the ratios to one is to one to one is to two or one is to three whatever you want depending on whatever product you want and then you can do everything heterogeneous catalysis is not a problem if you have a uh, if you have a high value product and if you can get cheap sources of carbon monoxide and hydrogen then you can do everything you like okay so that's but obviously this is concept concept is different there's a lot of different uh, developments that can take place and maybe some of you um, who are doing masters may decide to work in those sort of areas huh? eh? there you go another way of of getting uh, from the ship reaction that's right So the possibilities, this, we are talking about the possibilities here. Yeah. Is it? Oxygen. Oxygen. When you are doing water, water electrolysis, you are producing oxygen. That oxygen can come to go to your gasification. Simple. Oh, yes, yes, that's right. Yeah. So that's CO2, you decide what you want to do with it. It's not the shift reactor's problem anymore. It has, it has passed its uh, responsibility to your shoulder. But the Correct. So, so there lies the route. But if it has come from re renewable biomass, renewable sources, then you, over a very long period, low, longer time frame, you don't get worried about it. Am I right or wrong? No, I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about the gentleman behind you. Am I right or wrong? Because sometimes I deliberately say wrong things. Say, so have I said anything wrong? No. I know you listen carefully, though. You barely talk, but you listen carefully. It's just good. So only one aspect to work on. OK? <laughs> he doesn't mind, I think. Or even if he minds, he doesn't tell anything. Uh, such a perfect gentleman. So, uh, the, uh, so extending this a bit of a further, uh, a bit further, there is a company. Uh, it's called Green Freedom, uh, who have patented this. Uh, that uh, there has been a talk for three, four, five years now to capture, remove the CO2 from the. Yeah, because it's freely available, even though it's very low uh, concentration. How much? Four percent? So about 400 ppm. About 400. Yeah, okay, so we know that. Good. So what they're doing in, in here is that uh, they, they channel uh, CO2 through uh, potassium carbonate uh, from potassium bicarbonate. It's a very weakly bonded compound. Then uh, that potassium bicarbonate then uh, can be dissolved into um, into uh, over um, very uh, light, uh, sorry, my, uh, low temperature uh, medium to give you uh, oxygen back and uh, hydrogen and potassium uh, carbonate back. So these are gas phase and this is uh, liquid phase. And then living at a certain ratio of um, hydrogen and CO2 is in the one to one ratio. So essentially coming from an infinite source of carbon dioxide, um, you are concentrating it to a ratio that you want. So that's the principle that uh, Green Freedom took. You can look, at, uh, look about this technology in their website. And then um, they also, at the same time, they talk about producing the hydrogen. So that allows you to tweak the ratio of the hydrogen because you are getting the hydrogen from an independent source, as I mentioned. And then if you tweak it, then you can get your methanol. So, so overall reaction is this. 
And um, there has actually been a competition. I think in 2018 or so, there were about 10 different finalists. A lot of companies uh, or individuals, they came up with their, with their ideas. With their ideas. And then eventually, they came to, um, uh, to select, selected or uh, shortlisted 10. I'm not sure what exactly happened, uh, who was the winner. Maybe worth finding it out. So the, all these things that we have been talking about, DOE, uh, sorry, the International Renewable a Energy Agency, IRENA, uh, it should be written at I, uh, or everything in capital words. Like the IEA, you have the IRENA, International Renewable Energy Agency, based in Vienna, I think. Um, so they, they looked at the production of methanol from various sources. Obviously, one of the comparison is with the fossil fuels, and the coal and the natural gas, and the um, and compare that against uh, against um, um, carbon against wood and waste and residues by products uh, against the capacity of the plant. So it's, you can see that the, the prices are everywhere, but it's, it's a strong function of the capacity of the plant. So if the capacity of the plant increases, then something happens to the cost of the methanol produced from the renewable sources. Um, what is that? I don't know, yeah, maybe, what is that? In general, what we're seeing is that, in general, the cost of the methanol produced from the renewable sources, particularly woody biomass, it becomes competitive with the natural gas as the capacity increases. So that's the bottom line. But then again, these are from a whole range of assumptions and, uh, and studies that have been compiled into it. So um, rather than taking a headline view, headline conclusion, shouldn't be doing anything more than that. Um, if you really want to build one, I think you need to do your own um, techno-economic study, cost analysis, study, um, rather than relying on that. So in all of this, the major issue is um, the catalysts. And the cost of catalysts is not cheap. And I can tell you the catalyst manufacturers they spend enormous research dollar. BSF, which, which who comes and uh, does the lectures, uh, does provide one lecture in my advanced reaction engineering class in the first semester, which just ended. They told me that their annual uh, catalyst research budget is about four billion euros. Okay. In consequential amount, and then uh, when you then look at this particular graph, um, it's it's easy to see why it is um, because catalysts cannot be made uh, just out of heuristics. It has to be made very from very very scientific, well-focused studies. Uh, complemented with um, DFT, uh, density functional theory calculations uh, and then uh, making small scale, getting the proof of concept, getting to the larger scale, medium scale, then to the larger scale, then the larger scale, etc. So there's enormous of effort and some of the top scientists that you can imagine, they are very, very selective in, in, uh, in taking who they take. They look at not just the cap cap capacity of the, of the people, their level of knowledge, etc. They also look at their credibility and um, so that they know the person that they are selecting will be trustworthy and not be 
jumping onto a competitor uh, very soon. Um, so, and no reason, no, there is absolutely no doubt why um, uh, it's easy to find why they do it because you see the um, the trajectory of catalyst development. Is does that make sense to you? No, I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to you, the gentleman behind you. Okay. Does it make sense to you what uh, this shown in the graph? No. Um, That's something that I haven't collected really for this particular module because I just. Uh, oh, yes, absolutely. First of all, you cannot make certain products without the help of catalysts. That's for sure. The product flexibility from the same feedstock, you need particular type of catalysts. Without that, nothing will happen. As simple as that. Then the catalysts, particular, um, uh, their selectivity towards a particular product that really depends on the functionality of the uh, catalyst attributed to the uh, uh, um, uh, functionality of the catalyst uh, given to the uh, functionality given to the catalyst and we, we will see in the next uh, presentation there what it is uh, so if you look at this particular No, this is, we are, we, no, here we are talking about the chemicals industry. Yeah. Chemicals industry. And the, um, as I said, the 95% of the application of catalysis is actually in heterogeneous catalysis. So if you see the way to go from here, this just from an idea, whereby you look at at the, at the nanoscale the existence of the active site, whether you can make it or not, to actually be able to synthesize, and in the next presentation I will show how synthesis methods, synthesizing the method of making the same catalyst, how it can dramatically shift the production of your uh, desired product. We'll see that. Then to screening then perfecting it again, then character, uh, characterizing it, then establishing how the mechanism, how it actually works, so that you can, you can talk, uh, then establishing how fast it can work, then looking at how stable it is over a period of time, right? And then scaling it up, then pilot scale testing, then reactor testing, then plant testing. And at any of these steps, this actually can fail. So BSF was telling me that for one particular uh, catalyst development, uh, BSF, they, need, they look at about 20 years developmental time. Because at any step it can fail, which means they have to go back to the drawing board, find out what's the problem, and then start it again, and then do it again. Or discard it all the way. So uh, that's why. Um, these big catalyst companies, uh, they take a wholesale uh, turnkey uh, approach to, with the client. That, okay, I will sell you, sell you my catalyst, but you have to give me back this spent catalyst. Spent catalyst. Because otherwise, they can sell it to someone. And a huge, if you look at the contracts for catalyst sale, it's very, very detailed. Because otherwise, uh, I can buy your catalyst, I can reverse engineer it, and then try to sell it at a uh, low, low cost, simply because I'm taking advantage of all the um, um, fixed costs that you have spent in developing to a point uh, at the commercial level. Okay? So no wonder that the, the big, uh, this, this is the curve.
this is the trajectory and that every stage, uh, any stage it can fail and then you can come back again. Uh, and it's the end here. We haven't even mentioned the size selectivity and the shape selectivity. Uh, the same uh, catalyst in a cylindrical shape, uh, it can work uh, wonders, but in a uh, spherical shape, which is easy to make, it can give you completely different results. So a lot of the things are not yet understood really. And yes, the, I would say that the uh, majority of the uh, uh, mechanistic work that are going on are within this company's own R&D. That's why they recruit anyone, uh, recruit a lot of people, but with massive, massive screening, um, a series of interviews, and they're then judging their ability. But the, I know that BSF is looking for expanding into this Indian market. So if you have an interest in catalysis, just so one of my students is, um, was, um, uh, was specifically asked, would you like to take up a job in Shanghai or in um, Bangalore? And um, he wanted to do it in Australia. He said, no, uh, our growth market is here. So we want this to be here, people to be here. So. And they want, uh, they want people with many, many different backgrounds, not just chemists engineers who can take the uh, material to an in, uh, engineered uh, engineer it, uh, to a certain form that can be used who can do the testing uh, who can do computational work to uh, carry out uh, the effect of the different electronic structures of the material on the um, on the performance of this so it's a whole lot of um, so it's an extremely multidisciplinary um, activity. So let's um, let's move into this one for the time being.